All right, welcome back to Focal Point AFR Talk. Brian Fisher is my name. I want to welcome to our Focal Point studio, Fred Jackson, who is the director of One News Now. Go to onenewsnow.com. By the way, my latest column about Governor Perry is now up at onenewsnow.com. Fred Jackson is our news director. And, uh, Fred, uh, you've got some breaking news. We've been talking this whole program about same-sex marriage, what federal judges are doing, tyrannically throwing their weight around, how governors should respond to that. And we've got breaking news from the state of Kentucky. Tell us what's going on. Well, back on uh, February the 12th, U.S. District Judge John G. Haburn II issued an order that Kentucky had to start recognizing homosexual marriages that are legal in other states or other countries. And uh, he, he put a hold on that, and he was giving time for Kentucky to make an appeal. Kentucky's attorney general had asked for a 90-day delay in implementation of that February 12th order. Well, today, that same judge said, nope, I'm not going to allow that. So effective immediately, the state of Kentucky, by order of this federal judge, must allow, must recognize same-sex marriages performed in other states or, or countries. You know, I'm looking at this story from the Associated Press, Fred, and it uses the word immediately. Mm. Judge Hayburn issued a final order. I mean, the sense of finality here. I want you to do this, and I order you to do it right now. Yes. that's And, and of course, we have a Democrat governor in mm-hmm. Kentucky, so I'm not guessing we're going to get any pushback from the no. governor's office there. No, we're talking to some of the pro-family groups in that state right now. I just left the newsroom. And uh, earlier in the day, the indication was from the stories we were getting from Kentucky, they they really were disappointed, I'll put it that way, that there wasn't more effort by the half of the administration to fight this. Well, that's interesting. You know, it seems reasonable. You're talking here about the rest of Kentucky history Certainly reasonable to ask for a 90-day delay to continue to make your case. The judge said, nope, not interested, nothing. I've made up my mind. Don't confuse me uh-huh. with the facts. One other thing, Fred, this is a story that we covered back in the day, a Cinco de Mayo celebration at a, at a school. And, again, Cinco de Mayo is not an American holiday. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it has nothing to do with the United States. No. Nope. You know, it's, it's a holiday in Mexico to celebrate their victory over the French in 1862. It got nothing to do with America. So they have Cinco de Mayo at the school in California. 2010. Uh, 2010. A bunch of students show up with USA shirts, patriotic T-shirts, t-shirts yeah. to kind of show their support for the United States. They get in trouble. I don't know if they got suspended or kicked out of school or whatever. And they went to court to complain, and a judge ruled uh, against the students who were simply wearing pro-American T-shirts. And now the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals weighed in on today, and what did they do? They upheld the original judge's decision on this. It's an absolutely amazing story. The kids wearing the American T-shirts in this American school. On American soil. On American soil. We're told your T-shirts on this Cinco de Mayo day might upset the students of Hispanic descent. The kids were told to, you know, turn the T-shirts inside out. And if they didn't, they had to go to the principal's office. And basically, the gun was put to their head there. You either keep the shirts turned inside out. They refuse to do that or you get out of here. So that's what happened. And here's the other thing, the interesting point of this case, Brian, the Cinco de Mayo case. The school says the reason they were telling these kids to turn their, uh, their American uh, flag T-shirts inside out, they were worried they, those T-shirts might create violence. Now, they were not worried that the American kids were going to perpetrate violence on the Cinco de Mayo celebrating students, but the school admitted they were afraid the Cinco de Mayo celebrating students would get violent against the kids so wearing that, the American just, T-shirt. That's far more revealing about what the school administrators and, thought yes. about the Cinco de Mayo students yes. than the, 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 the students that were wearing the patriotic shirts. All right, well, listen, Fred, I appreciate that. Okay. Fred Jackson from our news division, news director, onenewsnow.com coming in. You know, and speaking of one other uh, thing here, ladies and gentlemen, we've talked about the fact we're becoming increasingly a Sharia-compliant nation. Uh, Katy Perry, the singer, produced a video. It's called Dark Horse. I haven't seen it. I got no interest in seeing it. But apparently in this video that's online, there is a, a figure in the video who is wearing a necklace with an Islamic symbol on him that spells out the name of Allah, and apparently he gets burned up in uh, the video. So he's got this pendant around his neck that says the name of Allah, 
and he gets burned up in this video. And a Muslim by the name of Shahzad Iqbal complained that this was blasphemy and launched a complaint about it. And the Sharia-compliant music industry went in and touched up the video, and they re digitally removed that Islamic uh, pendant. So we've got a music industry now that is Sharia compliant. So, you know, you juxtap juxtapose those two things. Students wearing a an American uh, patriotic T-shirt, uh, they're told you got to get rid of it because we are Cinco de Mayo compliant here. Now you've got Katy Perry, you got to get rid of that Islamic pendant because we are Sharia compliant uh, here. So that's where we are going. That's where we are headed uh, as a uh, culture. Now, one other sound bite. Let's grab clip number seven. Then we'll go back to the phones. 888-589-8840 is the number to call if you want to join the conversation. Uh, this is uh, Marco Rubio and uh, Senator Tom Harkin, another one of the Democrats that is resigning. And by the way, the Democrats are in big trouble when it comes to 2014, and they know it. Sean Trendy, uh, who does a lot of good political analysis, he is... He has calculated that there's about an 80% chance that the Republicans are going to take control of the Senate in 2014. So the Democrats are in a panic. Here's a New York Times CBS News poll saying that the GOP has an edge in the 2014 midterm elections. 42% of the people that they polled say that they plan to support the GOP in November, and only 39% say that they are going to back the Democrats. And so when you've got in these generic balloting polls you got an edge to one party or another it's very very significant and a uh, change in the colorado race i won't go into the details but a change there has uh, the two candidates swapped seats a guy by the name of Corey gardner is now going to run for the senate there in place of ken buck who's going to run now for Corey gardner's seat that he's vacating Corey gardner apparently a stronger candidate and according to this story on townhall.com, that makes 14 Democratic seats are vulnerable in November. 14 Democratic Senate seats are vulnerable in November. And they don't consider any. There's 15 seats that the Republicans are defending. None of them are considered vulnerable. And remember, if the Republicans take six Senate seats in November, they will take control of the United States Senate. Uh, and here's a piece uh, from Larry uh, Sabato's website generic ballot model shows Senate control at tipping point. And you go deep into this story, it's three or four pages, you go to the generic ballot, and generic ballot is one of the means that they use to predict outcomes. And be given the fact that the Democrats are defending 20 seats, Republicans just 15, there's 35 seats up, 20 of those seats are being defended by Democrats, and we just saw 14 of them, everybody recognizes, including Democrats, are vulnerable and uh, according to Sabato's calculations, if you've got a generic ballot margin of D plus 10, in other words, if the Democrats in the generic ballot, we just talked about it, it's 42-39 now Republican, if the Democrats were up 10 in that poll, they would still lose three and a half seats. If the Republicans are up five, and they're almost there, they're at three, it's 42-39, and the, the key is the generic ballot rating in September, so we're, we're a ways away from that. But if the Republicans are at plus five in the generic ballot, that means people are just, you're going to vote Republican or Democrat. They don't ask about candidates, just you're going to vote Republican or Democrat. If the Republicans are up five, then the predicted seat swing is 6.8, rounded up to seven seats. Uh, that would give the Republicans 52 seats in the Senate to 48 for the Democrats. So they're in a panic. Now, Senator Tom Harkin gave this impassioned speech about Cuba, what a paradise Cuba is. You know, and I was there. Uh, I, I was there for four days just a couple of weeks ago. And you want to know how much of a paradise Cuba is? This is this will gross you out. But this tells you what, you know, Tom Harkin says this is a paradise. What a paradise. Let me tell you the truth about Cuba. Do you know that in Cuba, this will gross you out, but it's a true fact. And, and, and I, I want to correct the misimpression that people have out there that it's some kind of paradise. In Cuba, a toilet seat is a luxury. I repeat, in Cuba, a toilet seat is a luxury. We were in a lot of places where all they had was the bowl. That's all I'm going to say about it. But they say, well, why don't you have a toilet seat? Because it's too expensive. We can't afford it. We pay 100 bucks for the bowl. We don't have another 15, 20 bucks to spare for the seat. So that is Cuba. Seen it with my own eyes.
So Tom Harkin goes on and on about what a wonderful paradise Cuba is. Here, clip seven, Marco Rubio's response on the Senate floor yesterday. Just one excerpt. What's the first thing the Venezuelan government did when these broke out? They cut off access to Twitter and Facebook and the Internet. They ran CNN out of there. They closed down the only Colombian station. Years before, they had closed down all the independent media outlets that criticized the government. Where did they learn that from? From Cuba. And yet we have to listen to what a paradise Cuba is. Well, I wonder, how come I never read about boatloads of American refugees going to Cuba? Mm -hmm. Why have close to one and a half million people left Cuba to come here, mm -hmm. but the only people that leave here to move there are fugitives from the law and people that steal money from Medicare that go there to hide? Why? How come no American baseball players defect to Cuba? Why don't any American doctors defect to Cuba if it's such a paradise? Ah, great word. Very powerful and to the point. Let's go to Robert in southern Indiana. Uh, Robert, welcome to Focal Point. What's on your mind? Thank you. Four points in less than 28 seconds. Hit me. Uh, the so-called pro-life groups are now proving that they are not serious. If we have nice, clean abortion facilities and the doctors are qualified, we've given up the fight on saving the life of the babies. Number two... Your, most of your callers do not know our form of government. Judges in the circuit are appointed for life, and they cannot get rid of them. Thirdly, they can be impeached, say though. impeach Obama. They think that puts him out of office. It does not remove a president. Well, say that, that again. Hold, hold it, Robert. In the Senate. Uh, uh, Robert, hang on a second. I missed point three. Go back, because I was, I, I was talking over you. Point three was about Obama? Yes. They, people say impeach Obama. That does not remove him, as most people think. He must then be convicted in the Senate. Correct. And finally, our hope only in 14 is electing conservatives, mostly Republicans, in the Senate. Because if Obama is allowed to name one more, one more Supreme Court justice, it's almost over for our form of government. All right, Robert. Well, listen, I agree with you on most of what you said there. Now, judges, and, and, and Robert's exactly right, Obama just impeaching him isn't enough. He's got to be convicted. The House of Representatives can impeach. That's like an indictment. But the Senate conducts the trial, and they have to convict the president with a two-thirds vote for him to be removed. And he's exactly right about electing conservatives in November. Because remember, Harry Reid engineered a change in the rules where now you can confirm a presidential nominee with just 51 votes. Now, I think the restriction is still in place when it comes to the Supreme Court, but that easily could be changed. So electing conservatives to stop Obama's nominees to the Supreme Court, absolutely critical. Focal point, AFR Talk.